what type of training goes on for businesses, what type of links between community and business would be needed to help us to develop the asset transfer, what type of relationships between community and learning might need to happen. So, for example, um, as I'll say in a minute, the, the high school using its land to grow food because there's not much of it around. I'll jump from there. It's incredibly participatory. We have this little mantra, if you eat, you're in. It's not difficult. You know, you're automatically a player in this. It's just a question of when you want to start to step up to the plate and take part. So there's something about the idea of inclusiveness that's very important. Um, and, and inclusiveness in the sense that it isn't just our town. We're not talking about self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is madness because it means that you have to then run to the hills and have build, build, build walls around your own community. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in building strong, resilient communities and being able to demonstrate to other places how to do this so that they can do it themselves. So we went, out, went to the newspapers, and this is one of the newspapers in England called The Sun. And The Sun is a famous newspaper for a certain lady that's always on page three, which, who doesn't wear many clothes. It sells about 15 million copies a day. It hits about 20 million people, if you include the, the, the internet. That's a very, very important moment for our project. We, up until then, we'd hit a lot of the broadsheet newspapers, a lot of the intellectual places had got to this and said, oh, that's a good idea, the Guardian, the, the Times, the Telegraph, all of those newspapers, in a sense, who are the people who probably already know quite a lot of that story. But hitting the sun was a major, major achievement for us because, first of all, it meant that we're starting to push this into the mainstream thinking of people around the country to get, get it in front of people who wouldn't normally necessarily encounter this. And secondly, and they've followed it up since, they're doing a series of things to talk about it, and people are starting to write into the sun saying, we're setting up one of these in our neighbourhood. So you get that viral effect, the Google age, used on the ground, not just on the, on the internet, to start to get people to, to, to network. Um, again, you can go on the web and look at that. There's tons of that stuff there. And there's the evidence of growing in the graveyard. Um, we, we use the graveyard because it's one of the places in town where there's available space. It's very good for nasturtiums and beans and, and maize, and, and possibly because there's a lot of nitrogen fixed. Um, I'll jump from that because I don't want to show you that one. We do this a lot, you know, just like this tonight, today. We show films, we show stories, we do what we call um, propagandas. Um, Ganda in England is a word where you look at something and you have a good look at it. And we have both propaganda's nights like this where we have a gander at a film. We look at a film and we talk about it. And they're all little films like the one we showed you, the civilization film, or it might be about Cuba, or it might be about a gardening project or whatever. And people come and you have fun and you bring the drink and you sit down. And on this occasion, we were looking at a film about some, some ways in which a community in, in South America had, had reinvented itself around using food as a, as a, as a connector. At the end of this film, you see all the tables are separate. <clears throat> what happened was that everybody said, oh, we don't want to sit on our own tables, and they shoved them all together and started talking. And we couldn't get rid of them. Because once people get going, they're energised and they're excited about the possibilities because it means that they can do something useful and connected to an issue that they're worried about, but they don't know what to do. So it's that easy step in that's really important. We're very, very interested in the project, in the idea that we are all, in some way or another, connected much more closely to food production. Now, at the moment, on this planet, we have about 2% of our population globally that are involved in any way with food creation. 2%. And yet, it's such a vital source of life. And so what we wanted to do was, was address that get more people involved, even if it's a minute part of their week, to participate in the conversation. So we looked at the idea of changing the idea of lo local food production. And in the high school, we're just about to build this, which is a hydroponic fish farm. And the community owned the fish farm, and we've raised the money to do this through various sources, including some charitable support. It's going to be a charitable-held project forever, 
It's community owned forever. It provides us with land because our high school has lots of land. It's the only big bit of land in the entire town. And it was being used, one bit of it's used for a football pitch, the rest of it they don't really bother with. That's not unusual in England. It's not unusual in lots of countries I go to where I look at schools and see that there's a big school field and maybe a little bit of sports area and a bit of tarmac to run about on when it's raining and nothing else. Think of the messages it gives you if you suddenly start to make that field an ecosystem, a food forest, a place where people can go and understand a lot of the things that I've been talking about in practical terms. And that's what this does. And there's two reasons for this. Fish in our part of the world really are pretty much disappeared entirely from the rivers. Um, you can't fish in our rivers. It's not allowed because it's too, there's too few fish. And what fish are there you probably wouldn't want to eat. Um, but also the marine biology around our coastal areas is, is under severe threat. So you have to look for alternative ways of cre creating fish if we, if, we, if we want to eat them. And they are high protein, etc., etc. So there's interest in doing it. E the second thing is this brings water in. And we bring water into this, this, this system on the school site from the hillsides. And we purify the water through reed, reed bed technologies. And the reed bed technologies are very high-tech. High the, the planting regimes are very, very high, sophisticated understanding of connections between different biological systems. So the children are learning, alongside students from Stirling University, how to build hydroponic systems. Those are very, very likely to be some of the major export technologies in the next 30 or 40 years in cities like China where you have huge numbers of people who have to eat and grow food within their environments. And what's beginning to happen is the hydroponics technology is racing ahead. And we, we, we need that understanding because we need to participate, if you like, in that knowledge base. So what we're looking at is educating our children into understanding hydroponics and the consequences of hydroponics so that when the, water, when the fish have grown, the water goes into, into troughs, they grow vegetables there, the effluent then goes onto this land it's high mineral rich and it means that you grow vegetables better, it, do, it replenishes the soil and people start to under, understand the cyclical nature of a, of, a, of a seasonal growing pattern and all those other things. So you create the structures to enable people to become part of a sustainable community. It's open access, it will have a cafeteria, the children do all of the various management of the project from start to finish, including the building of it. So they're at the moment involved in the design and development of the planning stage for the building. By this time next year, I could report to you, I hope, that's up and running, because it's due to go online around about November time. It's those sort of kids, just like any other kids, but they're involved in that sort of activity, which is helping them to begin to understand some of the things I think we need to learn about ecological literacy. It teaches us that we need to look hard at space and give people space to think about how to do this type of thing. But those spaces don't have to be big. We understand that you can grow things anywhere just from doing the project. You can grow things up walls, in troughs, on roofs, on the ground. It doesn't matter. You can experiment with all of those different things. And what we've been trying to do is encourage people to look at that use of space and do it imaginatively. So one of the groups took on little area in the middle of town and started planting herbs. It's symbolic. I don't necessarily eat those herbs because they're right on the roadside. But what they're beginning to do is challenge the idea that we just put flowers in. 